How does a plane simply fly over an airport to crash once it's beyond the end of the runway? That was the question posed by investigators working to uncover the mystery of a plane crash in Kyrgyzstan. A freight Boeing 747 crashed just outside of Manas Airport near Bishkek on January 16, 2017. The plane came down in a residential area near the airport where the accident killed 39 people, leaving an area of total devastation. What happened here? And how were the pilots so far off their approach path? Air ACT is a Turkish-based cargo airline. As part of their services, they lease out their fleet of Boeing 747 freighters to other airlines. The Turkish registered plane that was Tango Charlie Mike Charlie Lima was built in 2003. It flew as part of Singapore Airlines' cargo fleet before they sold it in 2015 to Air ACT. This was a 747 that was built for cargo. While some 747s were converted into cargo planes, this plane was Boeing's official freighter variant of the 747-400. It comes equipped with all the modern technology the passenger variant does. With this being a 747, cargo is loaded from the front through the nose. Air ACT had leased out this particular plane to Turkish Airlines to fly as part of their cargo fleet. The accident plane was given an all-white blank livery. Flying as Turkish Airlines Flight 6491, this plane was making a trip between Hong Kong and Istanbul. There was a scheduled stopover at Manas Airport in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. There, the plane would refuel and change flight crews. The accident of Flight 6491 would occur on the approach into Bishkek on this first leg of the trip. There weren't any passengers on board, just four crew members. The two flight crew members were 59-year-old Captain Ibrahim Durancy and 59-year-old First Officer Kazim Andul. There were also two other workers from the airline on board, Loadmaster Isan Koka and Freight Handler Meli Aslan. They had spent the last three days in Hong Kong and were due to hand the plane over to a different crew in Bishkek. In the cargo, the plane was carrying what could be described as miscellaneous consumer products out of Hong Kong. The stopover, Bishkek's Manas Airport, is small with only a single runway and few apron areas. Captain Durancy has flown to this airport twice before. On this occasion, the plane was to make an approach onto runway 26. Before leaving Hong Kong, the flight crew received a weather forecast for their arrival at Bishkek. A visibility of around 200 meters was noted, indicating fog was in the forecast for their arrival, and the fog would remain at the airport during the accident. For an approach to runway 26, a minimum required visibility of 300 meters is needed. Visibility would vary as the morning went on. It was 20 to 7 in the morning. Flight 6491 was preparing for their descent and approach into Bishkek. They had been cruising at 10,400 meters. At the time, when flying over Chinese airspace, altitude measurements in meters was preferred. Now passing into Kyrgyzstani airspace, Flight 6491 begins a descent to their first lower altitude of 22,000 feet at 6.51 a.m. Just before the hour struck at 7 a.m., the flight crew received updated weather information for Bishkek. Visibility was now 400 meters, meaning they can perform a safe landing. Interestingly, the flight path will take them out over neighboring Kazakhstan given the airport's proximity to the border. For the approach, the crew will use the instrument landing system on runway 26. The instrument landing system, or ILS, uses a radio beacon called a localizer which is located at the airport. The localizer sends out a radio signal on a Pacific radio frequency. Pilots can then punch in the same frequency on their radios and using a core selection, they can make a precision approach even in poor weather. Glide slope information is also given out in the ILS meaning planes are given direction for altitude to bring the plane to the foot of the runway. It's a crucial piece of radio navigation which is still used to this day. When the pilots received their weather update, almost immediately the captain asked his first officer to request a lower altitude, to which the controller refused at this time. Instead, the controller repeated their last transmission with clearance to descend at 22,000 feet at this moment, whereas the captain wanted to descend further. 
the captain would grow more frustrated with air traffic control as the approach continued. A conversation recorded on the flight deck revealed that the captain expressed frustration over the fact that they were passing over a large mountain range and speculated that the controller would give a lower altitude once passing it, but by that point, he thought the plane would be too high. They would continue to fly at 22,000 feet for a few more minutes. The captain, a couple of minutes later at 7.03, again expressed concern over the aircraft being too high for the approach. He then asked his first officer to repeatedly request clearance for a lower altitude from the controller. Ten seconds later, they were given a lower altitude of 18,000 feet. Despite the captain's concern, according to the approach charts for Bishkek Airport, the controller's instructions were in line with altitude requirements. The minimum safe altitude for passing over this mountain range was 17,000 feet. The controller had given them 18,000. Soon after, at 7.06, the plane was handed off to an approach controller. In between switching controllers, the pilots expressed a negative attitude for the controller that they had just been conversing with. Upon reaching the approach controller and asking for descent, they were clear to descend down to 6,000 feet at 7.06. Bishkek Approach also noted a weather update of calm winds at the airport with runway visibility changing again to 300 meters. It was freezing outside. In the fog, the pilots won't even be able to see the ground from their windows until passing below 200 feet. And that was in the dark before dawn. Given that the weather was just teetering on the safe limits, the controller requested that the flight crew of 6491 come back to them and report if they were sure on making an approach. To get to the airport from their current position, they had been flying towards a waypoint named Tokpa, as per their flight plan and clearances. Tokpa is located southeast of the airport, just over 16 miles away. To bring them onto the approach path and lined up with the runway, the pilots will fly a heading of 315 and intercept the inbound radial heading of 255 degrees from the airport's ILS. Captain Durancy did brief his first officer on their approach. This was done before the plane had even started descending. The investigation could not determine if this was performed in full due to limits of recording time on the flight recorders. Although having been cleared down to 6,000 feet at Tokpa, as was also stated to be normal in the approach charts to be at 6,000 feet or above at this waypoint, Captain Durancy still expressed frustration stating that they were too high for an approach. Flight 6491 entered the thick fog and cloud as it descended to the airport. Speculating icing conditions, the anti-ice system was switched on. What may have contributed to the captain's concerns could have been the aircraft's airspeed. In the initial descent, the speed brakes were not activated, resulting in a higher speed descent. The captain remarked that he was descending fast on purpose, and he would correct the speed later. 20 seconds after this comment, the speed brakes were activated. The time was now 7.10. Air traffic control gives another weather update with runway visibility now at 500 meters. They asked if the flight crew would like to make an approach, and they confirmed that they would. The investigation and accident report notes that flight 6491 passed over Tokpa at 9,200 feet. Usually, planes pass over this waypoint at 6,000 feet. While this was technically not in violation of any altitude restrictions, the plane was now reasonably too high for the approach. As to why the aircraft did not enter some kind of holding pattern to lose more altitude is unknown. It was concluded that in order for the plane to reasonably reach this altitude in time for this waypoint, the speed brakes and appropriate flaps would have been needed. With these systems, a steeper descent could have been achieved. Flight 6491 was cleared onto the ILS approach path at 711. The flight crew began preparing the aircraft for landing, including priming the radios to capture the localizer signal. At Bishkek Airport, the localizer frequency used for both runway directions is 111.7. With this frequency programmed into their radios, the signal was picked up from the plane at 714. Or so the flight crew thought anyway. The plane picked up a false ILS and glide slope signal which was located further ahead of where it should be, beyond the end of the runway. As the pilots were expecting the plane to capture a signal, it was assumed to be correct. Tests carried out on the ILS system after the accident suggest a false glide slope was found as part of the testing program. Using a completely different plane to recreate the scenario, 
this aircraft also picked up the same false signals. The pilots in this dense fog and dark sky only had their instruments and charts to go off of for the majority of this approach. The pilots could have been able to determine whether or not they were where they needed to be by cross-checking distance and altitudes on the airport charts to that of the aircraft's indicated metrics. Air traffic control also could have noticed the anomaly in altitude on radar. Flight 6491 was simply far too high on the approach. The Boeing 747 overflew the entire airport. In the flight's final moments, the captain would initiate a go-around as the plane inched closer to the ground. The plane, however, would fail to climb. Flight 6491 crashed into the residential area of Dachasu, just outside of the airport's boundaries. 900 meters beyond the end of the runway. The plane plowed through dozens of buildings. 19 homes were destroyed, as were 12 other structures. The plane disintegrated as the crash occurred, leaving a trail of devastation in its wake. The crash on that morning killed 35 people on the ground. Reports indicate that the captain was alive after the crash, still strapped in his seat. He died in transit to a hospital. Himself and the other crew members on board also died, bringing the death toll to 39 people. Among the dead were 17 children. Satellite imagery taken two days after the accident shows the scale of devastation to this small community. The day after the accident, ACT Airlines stated that they intended to pay financial support to those affected by the crash by compensating for all material possessions. The airline saying, that it was coming out of the plane's insurance. Many safety recommendations were made to the airline, Boeing, and air traffic control as the investigation cited many contributing factors to the accident, from the aircraft picking up a false ILS signal, to the flight crew failing to make an appropriate go-around resulting in a controlled flight into terrain. Hello, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you found this video to be interesting, be sure to like and subscribe as there is a new video every Saturday. Just a quick reminder that from Sunday the 5th of September, I will be taking a week off, but there will still be a video next weekend as I have prepared one in advance. I'm going to jump right in and thank my patrons for their incredible support. If you would like to get your name featured here or read out at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month and also get early access to all new videos 48 hours before they go out publicly. The link to that will be in the pinned comment below. A thank you to my £5 tier patrons Avery Tioda, Erin Wilson, Hector Palmatellas, Ken Zachman, Kevin Connors, Christy, Leon San Jennings, Maria Ennis, MG, Pac Man 7, Panic Chicken. Rebecca Rivers, So FP, and Sue So Sue Shoes. A special thanks to my generous ten pound tier patrons for their incredible support: Aidan Montgomery, Alex, Alex Keller, Anne Sid, Daniel Hendricks, Derek Bean, Karma, Mike Milton, Side Effect, Roger Mayer, and Where Are My Cheetos? Thank you all so much. That is it for me this week. Have a great day, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.